Hello class, welcome to our first session for participatory art. So what we're going to do in this uh, first session is we're going to talk about what participatory art is. I'll give you a basic uh, working definition and what it means for uh, a conception of art, <clears throat> of contemporary art. And then we're also going to talk about like say, some of the more uh, theoretical political stakes of this type of art. So for this this uh, this lecture, this is one where I'm going to stick close to the text, to Bishop's Artificial Hells, uh, because you're reading the introduction, which in some ways is the theoretical introduction to the to the book, to the text, uh, and to our class in many ways. And so it's it's very likely that this is the the hardest chapter um, to to read. So use this lecture as a way to navigate the concepts and the ideas and the political stakes of participatory art. Um, um, I won't be able to touch upon everything in the introduction, but I am going to distill probably like the what, what we might consider to be the most important questions or stakes involved in this type of art. So let's look at a few examples uh, by way of introduction for this session. So here's Rick, Rick uh, Tiravanesia, a Thai artist who's well known and associated with this type of work. Here you have people in a gallery <clears throat> enjoying a uh, Thai curry that the artist has made in the gallery. Um, and they're talking, looks like, if you saw this and didn't know if it was a work of art, you would say, well, this it looks like a, like a fun get-together or like a party or something like that. And then people drawing on walls or something like that, right? Um, so there's this type of work. Um, you can also uh, look at work by Superflex who are a Danish collective, three artists that work together. And they'll go in different places in the world uh, and they'll work with local communities. So here's a, here's a project they did called Guarna Power. Um, and he, the, here you are, you see them on the right, of the documentation of them working with Guarna farmers, um, helping them organize um, and to produce their own product, to have autonomy, to have control over their crop. Um, in, in order to have, um, you know, say so in their, in their livelihoods, in, in, in the work that they do. Um, and then this would be in the context of, let's say, multinational corporations that come in and buy up the guana that they make, drive down prices, um, and do, a, do various other things that are, um, that are often detrimental to these, to these um, indigenous farmers, to these local, these local communities. Um, so here you have a project, an art project, where the artists are actually working with a specific group of people and producing um, a product, um, Guana Power. Another example would be Thomas Hirschhorn. This happened in New York in 2013. This is the Gramsci Monument. This is part of a whole series of monuments that he did based off of famous philosophers. Uh, the Bataille Monument is mentioned in the, 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 the reading in, in Bishop's first chapter. Um, this is a later one, the Gramsci Monument, which he did at the Forest Hills uh, housing complex in the Bronx. I remember going to this. Um, and so what he did, he went in and he started to build this DIY structure, which you would almost think of like a community complex center. People could go to eat, they could go onto the internet, they could, there's a whole library, uh, there is uh, spaces for children to play. Um, there was a stage for musicians or poets or conferences and talks. Um, just think of it as this big DIY uh, site of a community center, right? That's in some ways instigated um, and directed by the artist, by Hirschhorn, but in collaboration with the, the local community who are also um, taking part in the building of, of the work. And then something much more recent, Muna Malik. Uh, this is called Blessing of the Boats River to River. This happened just a few weeks ago, actually. Um, this is part of um, the Battery, um, this is part of the Parks Project in, in, um, in New York, Battery Park. There's this structure that you can see, it looks like a, a large metal, um, um, like paper boat. And you would go online and you'd have directions how to make a paper boat yourself. And in, before making the paper boat, you would write some kind of aspirational phrase of what you want the future to be like. And then you would go here and then drop your, your paper boat into this larger um, um, metal boat. And so this is a participatory work for like uh, in the age of coronavirus, because this isn't people getting together all at once, uh, but this is people showing up at separate times um, and dropping off um, their uh, their little paper boat, which is their form of participating 
in the work. So these are three very, very different works, right? Um, here you have what looks to be almost more like a party. Here you have what's more like um, usually like a non-governmental organization, an NGO, you know, like uh, uh, humanitarian um, organizations that would go in to help local farmers. Uh, so very different, the resonance, the type of work is very different from this. Uh, from Tirbanesia. And then here you have what would be more like um, uh, a collaborative building of a structure, of a community center, almost more of a pedagogic project in some ways, allowing people to have access to libraries, to the internet, to social spaces that they uh, otherwise maybe wouldn't have had or would have had in a different way. Um, and then here you have one that's, um, this one feels to me like a little bit more sentimental, maybe a little more innocuous. It's not clear what this work actually does, um, but you might have a different take on it than me. But this is also bringing people together um, and having them participate in, in the work directly. So you're gonna see right off the bat uh, what participatory art is. It's artworks that involve the public, that involve people, often very collectively in this very collective fashion. But it's also quite malleable. Like there will be many, many different ways of 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 this type of work to unfold. Um, and one of the things we're doing in this class is try to understand what are all these ways in which participatory tactics have been used by artists and continue to be used by artists. And then maybe more importantly, how do we judge them? Uh, what does it mean uh, to say that a participatory work of art is interesting or successful or effective? or um, politically viable, or ethically viable, what, what, whatever the case might be, it opens up, I think you can tell, onto lots of very major questions about contemporary art and contemporary society. So this is all by way of, of getting us to a, a nice definition of participatory art. So participatory art is part of our post-studio practices. The word post-studio, or the idea of the post-studio, uh, comes from someone like Daniel Buren, um, and the idea is that we no longer think of the artist as working in a studio and making something in the studio that then gets shown in a museum or a gallery. The artist is now almost like um, a gadfly that goes out into society and, and makes things often with people, right, outside of the studio. Um, and there are lots of different names for this type of work. They're not, it's not interchangeable. Um, we're going with participatory art for this class. I mean, if you're interested in to, as to why this term kind of stuck and why Bishop uh, chooses the, this term uh, to talk about these projects, read the preface of, of Artificial Hells. Um, but we can talk about it within the constellation of a whole, a whole slew of other terms like socially engaged art, community-based art, experimental communities, dialogic art, dialogic meaning discussion, dialogue interventionist art, collaborative art, contextual art, and social practice. All of these terms, they're not coincident. They're not like the same exact thing, but they all share something in common, which is a conception of the artist going out into social space and working with people um, as, uh, as, as a form of making um, a form of making art. And so this is something that began especially in the 1990s in contemporary art, though as this class will show you, um, there is a provenance, there is a, a longer provenance back in history for this kind of kind of work. So that's something that we're going to be tracing and unfolding throughout the, the semester. Um, the other important thing to note about participation, participatory art, is that it always, almost always, privileges process over like a definitive finished product. So rather than like an image being important or a concept being important like in conceptual art, or an object in a, like traditional forms of art. Participatory installations or, or artworks tend to value what, what can't like be completely grasped. So like a group dynamic, so uh, like a bunch of people eating food um, and talking and having like this moment of, of, of socializing, um, social situations or change of energy or raised consciousness. Um, these all designate almost like the intangible things that come out of, of, of people coming together um, in, in like a, you know, a sociological way in, in, in many ways, um, but within a, an art setting. So participa participatory art privileges process, um, and you're going to see that over and over again. So this all has 
uh, ramifications for traditional notions of of, of, of of what the artist is. Uh, so the artist is going to no longer be thought of as like this brilliant individual, uh, but the artist is going to be thought, thought of more as like a collaborator or like a producer of situations. Situations comes from the Situation International and Guy Debord, which we're going to study in this class. Um, it's almost like setting a stage for something to happen. The artist is almost more like a director in some ways, um, or, or a, um, a, a maestro of social situations or something like that. But no longer like the brilliant uh, genius who makes like the object that no one else can make, right? Like a Picasso or something like that. It also changes the concept of the artwork. Um, so rather than the artwork becoming this static, rarefied object, Again, that can be placed in a gallery or in a museum. Participatory forms of art, like the artwork itself, will be much more of like a project um, or an installation. But the word project is very, um, very key here. And the, the, the idea of art as a project became very hot in the 90s um, and, and going forward and still today. So like project-based artworks. And then, of course, this all has ramifications and consequences for the concept of the audience. So rather than being the passive observer or passive viewer, like um, we supposedly are in a museum or in a gallery or in a theater where we just sit there and look at something, um, now the audience actually becomes an active participant in the work, right? Um, where you eating Thai food, a Thai curry in a gallery, you actually are in the work. Um, and the discussions you have make the work in some ways, right? Um, and here we already get to one of the big theoretical questions from this opening chapter. Um, and it's something you might want to uh, um, uh, discuss at some point. Uh, do you think this binary opposition really works? Is it really true that we have a strict separation between like viewers who are passive and then like... Um, 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 viewers who enter into work and, and are active? Or is there already a way in which like the supposedly passive viewer in, a, in, a, in like a theater or in a museum, is there a way in which they're already in some ways active as a, as a participant? The muddling and breaking apart and challenging of this binary is something that Jacques Rancière uh, has done, which after you've read this first chapter, you'll, you'll, you'll see that for Bishop, uh, Rancière is, is a key philosopher and a key anchor for her theoretical position on this, on this type of art. Um, so Rancière is going to argue that mm, there's no real strict separation between passive viewer and active participant. Um, even the most passive viewer is sort of using the work that they're seeing as a way to tell a story about their lives. Uh, even following along with a story is a way of, of being in some ways um, a participant or active. So that's an interesting question um, to, try, to try to work through. So then how, how has this work been interpreted since the, the 90s? Um, usually it's, it's uh, interpreted in, in a, like a traditionally Marxist way, uh, that this work is a form of de-alienation of society. So when it comes to Marxist political philosophy, um, like Marx 101 is that capital, um, the economic system of capitalism, is a system that alien, alienates people in various ways. By alienation, we mean like you feel uh, separated um, you feel um, uh, left out. Um, in some ways, alienation can also be like a form of abuse, uh, like you're, you're abused in some ways. Uh, like the work you do is, is uh, not only does it separate you from, from society, uh, but it also in some ways can be, is, is harmful um, or it can be repetitive or wh whatever it might be. So Marx talked a lot about alienation and how, how um, especially working class poor people become alienated through this, this capitalist system, the capitalist economy. And so forms of art that reintroduce the public within culture, uh, within art making, within politics, um, that give them in some ways um, a, a, a form of having sovereignty and power over their lives is a form of de-alienation. So I hope you see um, why this lens has been used for this type of art, because it's quite literally a work, a type of art where the public enters into culture, enters into art, and they become producers of 
the, of culture and of art making rather than these passive alienated observers, right? And so someone like Guy Debord, who we'll talk about quite a bit when we get to the Situationist International, um, in his book, very famous book, a uh, very important book called Society of the Spectacle, this is usually the big reference point for participatory art. Debord uh, critiqued, this is in the 1960s, but you're going to see, this is an amazing book to read because there are ways in which it, it, it works so well in critiquing and analyzing our own contemporary society uh, based on, on, on the spectacle of the internet. But what he called the spectacle, uh, which is, you know, like a, um, a public sphere, uh, a social space that's just filled with images, uh, images that like uh, condition you, that keep you numb, um, that often in some ways will tell you lies, uh, but ultimately keep you uh, sequestered in your own space and separated from like actual life, what, what de Ball deemed to be actual life, uh, which would be outside of the spectacle. Um, participatory has been read in this way. Uh, so Bishop quotes, quotes it, in, uh, um, uh, puts it in this way. She says, uh, this rehumanizes society rendered numb and fragmented by the repressive instrumental, instrumentality of capitalist production. And that simply means it's very much like the Marxist reading that the spectacle is part of capitalist production. It's capitalist production that has now become an image economy or a media economy. Um, but nonetheless, it, it still continues to alienate people. Um, it continues to, uh, in some ways, show them something um, that's illusory, that's not real, that's not real life, right? And so one of the most famous quotes from, um, from De Beau, from the Society of the Spectacle, is this phrase right here. It's actually the first phrase of the book itself. In societies where modern conditions of production prevail, all of life presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was once directly lived has moved away into representation. Um, this is a, quite a telling quote. Um, so the idea that representation, that simply being a viewer, um, is something different from actually living real life, um, as if our lives are now mediated by... Um, the images that we consume um, and that we're a part of. And so this is well before uh, social media. This is well before um, um, Facebook and, and, and everything else. But this is a good way of describing the way in which um, our lives, in some ways, we ourselves can become a spectacle. We can become spectacularized and monetized where our data, our personal information, um, and the avatars that we've formed online, um, they can become uh, um, um, in some ways more real than, than us within this economy of, of, uh, of, of visual mediascape. And so participatory art, the idea is, the way it's often interpreted, is that it gets back to real life, like real life situations, not just these illusory uh, representations online or in the media or, or what, what have you, but you get reacquainted with what it means to have um, um, social situations with actual living people, right? So this is why Society of the Spe Spectacle and De Boer and the idea of the spectacle has been such an important um, theoretical lens to understand this type of work. Um, and there's a curator, Nicolas Bourriot, um, a curator theorist, who wrote, in some ways, the definitive book, or the, the, initially, the initial definitive book about this type of work that he called Relational Aesthetics. And he comes directly out of this critique of the spectacle. So he also thought that contemporary, um, this is in the 90s when this work really starts to take off, that contemporary society is a form of, of alienation, um, that the, the image economy is one that really keeps people uh, dumb, numb, separated, um, and, and in line. And that uh, he started to see these artists work in ways that were more convivial, that collaborated with people where the work wasn't an object, but was more like a meeting or an encounter or an, or an event. Um, and that this was then a way to sidestep this media economy. Um, this this um, late phase of, of image capitalism 
Um, and for Borio, again, like the critique of, of the spectacle, being in real situations, events with, with people, um, with, with encounters, with discussion, um, with even just like a get-together. If, if a work can do that, then in some ways it's critiqued or it's sidestep or it's gotten out of the, out of the spectacle. So Borio talk this, uh, described this type of work as relational aesthetics. And in some ways, um, they wouldn't, all of the works that he mentions in this book would not technically fall under participatory art in each case, uh, but there's quite a bit of overlap. Right. So if you're interested, this is a good, a good book to read. And I'm sure at some point this semester we'll revisit some of his ideas because he's been, he's been pretty key. So um, the crucial intervention uh, that, that uh, Claire Bishop had in these, uh, in these debates, um, and that's encapsulated in uh, an essay that she wrote and then also in this larger text that, that we're reading for this class, Artificial Hells. Um, her her contention about this type of work is that um, just because a work brings people together, just because uh, a work is, is social, doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Um, and even more than that, uh, she claims that uh, if, if all we're going to do is talk about an artwork as, as uh, bringing people together, as creating some, some kind of social situation, then... If it's done that, every single type of work like this is equally successful. Um, and here she says, there can be no failed, unsuccessful, unresolved, or boring works of participatory art because all are equally essential to the task of repairing the social bond. So if this work, all it does is bring people together in order to repair the social bond, then the only criteria we have is, is just to see, okay, it brought people together, and therefore it's a success, right? So I think you can see why someone like Bishop finds this to be inadequate, especially a Bishop who's a critic and, a, and an art historian. Um, there are a number of reasons why, why participatory work isn't automatically successful just for bringing people together um, and, and, and having a, a social situation become um, concrete. Um, there has to be in some ways, since these are claimed to be works of art, there has to be some sort of aesthetic criteria. There has to be some sort of way in which we can judge these works to be uh, aesthetically uh, interesting or compelling or not compelling, right? Um, there has to be in a way in which we can assess these, these sort of participatory participatory works to be successful as artworks and not just as like sociological experiments, because otherwise, these can these these are basically just like uh, get-togethers or parties or um, or um, non-governmental organizations that work with communities, right? There has to be something about these works that are assessed and analyzed vis-a-vis -vis art as artworks, right? So this is one of the key aspects of her intervention in this field of participatory art, and this is why she's become so important. Um, and one of the defining theorists and art historians for participatory art is that she opened um, she opened the field to discuss these works within a broader scope rather than simply like sociology um, and sort of feel good community um, sociological type of type of work. Um, so you can see this is this can be in some ways uh, confrontational, especially for. Um, theorists who do think that socially engaged works are successful because simply by virtue of actually bringing people together and again repairing the social bond a lot of this work has to do with the ways in which society has been um, affected by uh, late stage capitalism and the economies um, that alienate people um, that exploit people um, and that keep that keep people um, um, in states of, um, of what some theorists would say, like anesthesia or, or numbness or, or ignorance, right? So th this can be very confrontational. And in the, in the chapter you're, you're reading for this first week, um, she talks about some of these theorists um, who have a different conception of participatory art. Um, so there's a further worry here, um, which, is, which is interesting, is that, and I think I broached this in the, in the beginning, is that this type of work has proven to be really ideologically malleable, um, in that it fits, it, it fits with lots of different conceptions, lots of different politics, 
Um, and another thing that Bishop talks about is that this seems to fit a little too seamlessly in the conception of of uh, a new economy that's based on precarious workers and being self-entrepreneurial. So here's a funny um, uh, cartoon on the right here. You know, as artists and writers, we're all actually working 24 hours uh, a day. It's the idea of living in an economy now where you work on temporary projects or you have temporary contracts and you have to almost, everybody has to be their own curator and their own um, social media uh, curator and their own um, like entrepreneurial. It's like, like, like the thing is to be self-entrepreneurial um, and to sort of live by the seat of your pants from project to project in this very precarious precarious way um, so this is a type of this is a type of economy um, that that has rightfully started to become come under critique uh, and come under fire um, because it's a it's economy it's an economy where the state and really like the community um, or, or the politics or the people within like democracies where it's as if like no one thinks that um, there should be um, sort of some sort of communal or governmental uh, uh, consideration of welfare of social programs um, as they were uh, traditionally known to be that now it's basically just everybody becomes their own uh, CEO they become their own like entrepreneur um, and they go out and they try to make money and they try to secure contracts and projects right um, so maybe you know what this what living like this is like um, and as an adjunct I know what it's like to be um, uh, part of uh, like a precarious workforce that works from class to class and from project uh, pro to project to project and semester to semester um, but, and I'm definitely not alone um, and so there is a way and I think Bishop points this out in, in a compelling way that this type of work that's the artist going from project to project uh, that it, it's almost it it falls too seamlessly within this new type of economy of this precarious part-time uh, worker um, in a society where more and more welfare um, 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 and state help and, and public funding and public support is 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 being uh, eviscerated is being is, is crumbling, um, and it's been crumbling since the seventies and the nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties, especially in the UK and in this country. Um, but by this. So yes, uh, she she mentions Andrew Rosh, who's, who's a sociologist. He calls this the no-collar workforce, and that artists provide a useful model for precarious labor since they have a work mentality based on flexibility, working for project to project, um, and they understand their work to be in some ways a type of sacrificial labor, where um, in order to, to be an artist, to be creative, to be free, they then also have to accept this precarity and accept like less money and less security, right? So. Um, it's interesting how this type of work, which really comes to the fore in the 1990s, almost runs parallel with this history of the precariat, of this new type of economy where everybody is their own entrepreneur. But this, this, the way in which this type of work is ideologically malle malleable runs even deeper, uh, runs even deeper than this. Um, so at one point in, in, the, um, in this first chapter, Bishop talks about um, how participatory art almost I forget the name of, of the critic or the, the theorist but he, he almost says that like this type of work prepares people to wean themselves off of public support or to sort of accept the fate of, of living in a state where welfare programs like health care like public funding for the arts like uh, child care like education all these things get privatized um, and everybody is sort of then competing for them that this type of work actually prepares you for this new kind of um, um, precarious economy, which is in some ways a very conservative position. So this is what I mean by ide ideologically malleable. Just because a work is participatory doesn't necessarily mean that it's progressive, right? And I'm going to show you <laughs> some examples where that's definitely not the case. So here, here are some, here's an example that's always struck me. I heard about this about a year ago. Um, you may know about Davos. Once a year, the, the world's wealthiest people, they get together at Davos to talk about humanitarian problems and the state of the world. Um, and what they started doing a few years ago, which created um, quite a stir and some, and it was almost like scandalous in some ways, it was definitely debated, is at Davos, part of the programming there would be these refugee camp simulations where people could go in, the, the attendees of, of um, 
Davos could go in and they could experience what it's like to be a refugee in a camp. They would walk in. Um, there's like you, you see there's like a border crossing here. There, there are fake, um, fake police, uh, military police or soldiers. And so these, these, you know, the elites of the elites are trying to experience what it's like to be in a state of poverty, precarity, uh, and to be in a state of being like a refugee, right? Um, and this is all, the, the intentions are good, right? Because, of course, one of the big challenges, especially in Europe politically, is uh, our, our refugees, is migration crisis, um, which come from global warming um, and, and, and conflicts. Uh, but then there is something almost, you know, this is something we could have a discussion about. There is something almost uh, a little off-putting or a little strange or maybe like a little, um, it just it seems perverse for these very wealthy people to temporarily experience what it's like to be a refugee. Um, and then, of course, go back to Davos and have like a very expensive dinner that night, right? There's something incongruous and weird about it, um, arguably. Um, but I point this out because what is this, these, these refugee camp simulations, what are these if not very similar to participatory forms of work? You can imagine an artist setting up this camp for people to experience what it's like to be a refugee. So this is what I mean by these type of works. They can be ideologically malleable. Here this is, you know, very elite upper crust, um, uh, this is a very elite upper crust setting, right? Um, it gets more nefarious than that, though. Um, an even more recent example, I was just reading um, a really wonderful artic article in the New York uh, Times Review, the New York Review of Books, uh, that reviewed a, a recent book by uh, Ben Buchanan. This is called The Hacker and the State. I haven't read it yet, but this article really piqued my interest, so I want to pick this up at some point and, and read it. Um, and this is all about the recent um, meddling in political elections, especially the one in 2016, especially by the Kremlin, um, by, uh, by Putin and by Russia. And so there's this incredible moment. There's this incredible thing that happened, um, I think it was 2016, in Houston, where Russian bots or Russian operatives, they set up two fake Facebook websites uh, for groups that lived in Houston. And so one website was like a pro-Islamic website um, that was uh, championing um, um, freedom of religion and that was um, 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 against Islamophobia, against discrimination, and so on and so forth. And they then set up another website that was Islamophobic, that was against Islam, that was against Muslims, and so on and so forth. Um, and so these were two fake Facebook groups, right? But they started to attract real people living in Houston, some who gravitated towards defending freedom of religion and defending Muslims. And then the other one who was uh, that was more uh, fascist, more bigoted um, um, and more Islamophobic and anti-Muslim. Right. And it doesn't end there. So these Facebook groups, one day they set up at the same time, the same place, in front of this um, Islamic center in Houston, marches and rallies uh, so that both groups end up showing up together and the police had to be called in because it started to get confrontational and violent, right? So this is crazy. These are fake, talk about the spectacle, right? These are fake Facebook groups that were made by, by Russian operative trolls, basically, that then real life people got wrapped up in it um, and participated in it um, and even had this confrontation on the, on the streets of Houston. Well, again, what is this if not akin to a, a participatory form of work, not made by an artist, a well-meaning progressive artist, but made and, 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 and the situation was created and made by a foreign government? Uh, that was trying to meddle, and in fact, it looks like very did a good job meddling in um, the democratic election of in this country of 2016. So again, it's as if uh, these this, these participatory types of work in 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 the new world that we find ourselves in uh, have proven to be really ideologically malleable. Um, that it can come, they can be enacted, um, or they can look very close to like an artist working in a progressive way 
in some ways it can just be turned on its head and then it can become like a very reactionary, um, somewhat more nefarious um, and illegal um, action. Right? So, so it's very interesting. Again, the idea that we can't automatically think that a participatory work where people get together is a good um, thing, um, it, it's not enough, right? We need to introduce other criteria and other judgments, um, many of which will come from aesthetics and art history. Um, like we have to, um, in some ways, be able to interpret these um, on different registers rather than simply the sociological. At least that's Bishop's claim. I'll be interested to hear what everyone um, thinks. And then one final example uh, from something that just happened, um, uh, which, which gets to another point about participatory work. Um, this is Banksy. You probably all know Banksy, probably the world's most famous uh, street graffiti artist. Um, but he's also quite an activist, um, both in animal rights um, and also in um, um, class politics, and also in this case um, with the with refugees and the refugee crisis and these humanitarian crises, especially in the Mediterranean. And so Banksy funded very recent. This is this was in the news this week. He funded a boat um, in the Mediterranean. And the boat was named, is named Louise Michel after like a French feminist from, from um, the 20th century. And here, of course, is a Banksy graffiti, this little girl with a heart-shaped uh, life preserver, right? Um, and so he, uh, he read about this activist uh, who worked for NGOs, non-governmental organizations, who would go out and rescue um, refugees in the Mediterranean coming from oftentimes Libya and northern parts of Africa, escaping the Syrian civil war, or in some cases escaping uh, global warming climates that used to be habitable that are no longer habitable, so people have to, have to leave. Um, and so her name is Pia. Um, and she's the one who, who uh, works on this boat with other activists and other former, uh, she used to work as an NGO. And he wrote to her anonymously. No one knows who Banksy is, really. Um, he's been able to remain anonymous. He says, hello, Pia, I've read about your story in the papers. You sound like a badass. I'm an artist from the UK, and I've made some work about the migrant crisis. Obviously, I can't keep the money. Could you use it to buy a new boat or something? Please let me know. Well done, Banksy. Um, so at first, she thought this was a joke. Uh, but it turned out to be real, um, so real now that you actually have uh, this boat out in the Mediterranean as we speak, looking for and rescuing um, refugees that are trying to escape, uh, again, oftentimes Libya. So it turns out in Libya, uh, the Libyan police, along with the help of, of European governments, will get y you know refugees that are trying to leave Africa, bring them back to Libya, and then um, it gets a little hairy because I think uh, it's it's possible that they they might they, they get sent off into like military camps, um, and they're impeded um, to either going back home or trying to find you know like a different life somewhere else. And so this is a type of participatory work in some ways, although Banksy really is only funding it. Um, and it's in, in some ways you might not even consider it an art project, but it's a project that an artist is involved with. But it's a good example of, of a really, I mean, this is such a commendable, amazing work. I'm not going to, I don't know anyone who sort of like would critique it because, you know, they're actually saving people's lives. Um, so it's a wonderful work. But it also raises the question about contemporary society and politics and contemporary economy. Why is it that we live in a world and a time where an artist can become a non-governmental organization? Why would this even be necessary? Why is it that we don't have the infrastructure in place to help people um, like refugees? Uh, this is a really interesting challenge of this type of participatory work, especially the type of participatory work that's community-minded, that will actually go out and try to help certain communities. This is wonderful, right? But it's also symptomatic of a time where uh, governments and economies are not helping people, right? It's as if we're entering into a new age where everything is wild, wild west, um, the the elites, um, um, th those who have the means, they can survive, they can get their health care, they can get their education, and so on and so forth. Those who don't, they're just left 
to uh, basically um, to fend for themselves, right? Um, so why is it that that an artist can almost become an NGO, um, or become a humanitarian activist? It's wonderful, but it's also symptomatic of a time as if this space has been evacuated, right? Um, and so we might not want this to be the case, right? Maybe we want Banksy be, to be doing something else, uh, working on some other issue because we have the infrastructure in place to help these people that he wouldn't be needed, right? Um, so this further broadens the context of this kind of uh, participatory art. And I'll just end here. Um, so there were a number of uh, projects in the first chapter um, that when we get together for Zoom, we're going to talk mainly about Deller, and we're going to have a pres you know, uh, our, our wonderful first presentation on Deller. Um, and he's often considered one of the first and one of the most important artists working in this sort of participatory mode. But I'll leave you with one final question that I think we'll pick up, we'll pick up with Deller, uh, but it's not only Deller that you could talk about this question. So in the introductory chapter, uh, Bishop talks about this ethical turn, which is related to the ways in which we've been talking about sociology. Uh, she's going to argue that to, to judge these works on whether or not they're ethically successful also collapses the issue or sidesteps the issue and doesn't allow us to talk about them in an aesthetic way or um, as art projects, right? Um, so she talks and compares Odra Projesi, a collective of three women artists um, who are Turkish, who do work that's very much communal. They, they, they work with communities um, um, almost like um, um, humanitarian work in some ways, right? And then you have someone like Thomas Hirschhorn, who's, who remains like more of a, an artist director, um, like he does impose certain conditions, but he will also work with marginalized communities, as you saw in the Gramsci Monument and the Bataille Monument. And so out of these two artists, uh, the artist that has been the most criticized would not be Odra Progessi, um, who are deemed to be, you know, basically helping people. It's a conception of participatory art as allowing people to get together and create better conditions for living. Whereas Hirschhorn seems to come in um, with a bit more of, of um, how do I put it, like uh, guidelines and parameters for how the work should go, um, imposing even the content itself, like the Bataille Monument is about the philosopher George Bataille, or the Gramsci Monument is about the political uh, philosopher Antonio Gramsci, right? And so there are some that have accused Hirschhorn of almost... Um, of being like a type of artistic tourism within marginal spaces, uh, within poor poor spaces, um, rightly or wrongly, right? Um, Bishop, I think you'll tell, you can tell, is more on the side of Hirschhorn, is more on the type of the side of a participatory work being a bit more disturbing um, and not seamlessly integrated within a community and not just a sociological or like an ethical project. Like there's something about um, about Hirschhorn's project and some other artists where they they almost um, create uh, counter conditions, or they kind of negate, or they um, how do I put it in a more more clear way? Um, they 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 sort of challenge um, they challenge the public and they challenge critics, um, and they're not like clear cut sociological ethical. Um, um, situations. Uh, they create maybe even a little bit of dissensus or antagonism, right? And so for Bishop and for Rancière, Jacques Rancière, who we talked about a moment ago, who's sort of the, the theoretical anchor, um, politics and art do not function without a little bit of dissonance, without a little bit of antagonism, without a little bit of conflict, Right. Otherwise, everybody's on the same page. There, there's almost no dialogue, and everybody's just like going with what's deemed to be the proper way of 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 of, um, of proceeding. So there's something about art, and there's something about politics that needs to have that you need to have disagreement. You need to have friction in order for um, new spaces of meaning and new possibilities to open up. Right. Um, so that's one reason why Bishop 
um, privileges this type of work that might be a little bit more confrontational rather than Ojeda um, um, Oda Progesi. Uh, but you may feel differently, and uh, some critics and some writers have felt have felt differently. So it's an interesting question, this question of the ethical turn. Is it enough not only for participatory work to be you know, simply sociological, um, but is it enough for a work to be like ethical, to create ethical improvements, right? Um, or does it have to do something more, something that would be specific to a, like a political conception of art making? Okay, so I think that's more than enough uh, to help you negotiate and navigate that first chapter um, and to see this type of work within a broader socio-political uh, context. So I hope you got a lot out of it. And um, uh, until, the, until the next one, take care, everybody.